in their own membrane, but they also had the host membrane outside. outside yeah, the host is just making that. I mean, he's just building a membrane inside of it? Just like they're this around the nucleus, around the no, it's, endoplasmic it's, reticulum. It's just a vacuole. It's just a vacuole, yeah, yeah but I, just, I, guess, I guess there's no previous need to have done that. I imagine, yeah, that way. We can turn around. All right. So we're going to revisit endosymbioses a little bit um, and then talk about a related topic, which is lateral gene transfer. And in the next lecture on Wednesday, we're going to talk both about sort of the theme of the lecture is going to be extremophiles, but we're going to use it to talk about some of the different ways that people study microbes out in the field or bringing them into the lab and that's sort of going to be an excuse to talk about mechanisms of studying microbes. We're going to have a review session right after uh, this. Uh, one of the only times we could get a uh, big enough room available um, in Wellman, um, to Wellman. Uh, so I'm going to march on over there right after this. And I sent around an email with other review sessions that we're going to have. I'll send that around again. Um, so, yeah. Uh, are you going to be able to podcast your review session? Thanks to our wonderful uh, TA here, we are going to podcast this one, and he's going to train me in how to do this, so I will hopefully be able to do the other ones. Too. I'm somewhat incompetent occasionally, so we'll have to see about that. But it should, we should be able to podcast all of them. Um, I'm going to be doing, you know, a lot of stuff on the board, which we're not going to videotape. But. Uh, so what I want to do is go over with a slightly different angle uh, the plastid evolution that we talked about before, just to really uh, bash this into your heads probably more than you want to hear. Um, so I, I also want to say that I... The, what I'm doing with the plastid evolution, I've also done with many of the other parts of the evolution of organisms in this class. I'm going back and forth between data, phylogenetic trees of organisms, observations of cells, and models. So people have created models for what they think happened in the evolution of these organelles, or in the duplication of those elongation factors, or in various parts of the tree of life, and then we look at data and we ask sort of how well does that data match our model and does the data match other models? And that's basically how you apply the general scientific method to evolutionary studies. It's not really any different except we're studying things in essence in many cases that occurred in the past as opposed to things that are occurring now, although a lot of evolutionary biologists like me end up studying mostly things that are going on now. The stuff we're talking about here, you build this model of past events and then you test whether or not the data fits into that model. So let's go through that in terms of the chloroplast evolution. So people observe chloroplasts all throughout different eukaryotes. In many ways they are structurally similar in many of these organisms that people have looked at, although there is a great deal of diversity in the inner workings of chloroplasts across different organisms. We're going to temporarily at least, ignore that. So there's this model that people have created to try and explain part of the evolutionary history of chloroplasts, which is an extension of that same model that we talked about for the evolutionary history of the mitochondrion, which is we start out with a cell. In this case, we're starting out with a eukaryotic cell that has a nucleus and a mitochondrion. And that cell has the normal features of any standard uh, boring default eukaryote. And um, that organism developed some type of interaction with a cyanobacterium. Could have been a, as I think someone in this section asked, could have been a beneficial interaction, could have been a parasitic interaction. We don't really know the details exactly of that interaction, but there was some interaction that allowed them to most likely co-evolve with each other for some period of time. Eukaryotes, like amoebae and white blood cells and lots of different eukaryotic cells from throughout the tree of life have this nice ability to bring things inside of them by this 
general phagocytosis process. So if you go to any environmental sample, say some pond water or a termite gut or whatever, and you look at the microbial eukaryotes that you find in those samples, they look like garbage cans. I mean, they're literally frequently filled with all sorts of stuff, particles, dirt, organisms, um, various membrane-bound compartments. They're, you know, a lot of these amoeboid forms are going around and scavenging up anything they can find. Frequently, you see this for the heterotrophs, that is, the organisms that are not fixing carbon themselves and having to scavenge energy from the world around them. Some of the autotrophic organisms that are fixing carbon, they may be less inclined to sort of vacuum up everything in their world around them. But you see this very commonly for eukaryotic cells. It's sort of a hallmark feature of eukaryotes. Yeah? Um, in the pre-lab, it said uh, some parasites, they have to trick it into phagocytosis. If they eat everything, why do they have to trick it? Uh, Generally, they don't complete, many of them don't completely eat everything. They're chemically sensing the world around them. A lot of cells have receptors on the outside of the cell that are detecting things like sugars, proteins, various things that they want to eat. And many of those parasites bind to one of those receptors, and that triggers the, the endocytosis or phagocytosis process. So, you know, there are certain organisms that it's, you know, not that tricky to convince them to bring something inside. There are others that are much more picky, but still parasites, viruses, and other things, they have ways of binding to the surface and triggering this swallowing process. Um, and it's pretty diverse. I mean, the, the post-parasite evolutionary sort of arms race very frequently involves those outer membrane sensing complexes that is how the parasites get brought in. Um, this type of thing generally does not happen in bacteria and archaea because of their cell walls. Bacteria and archaea generally have sort of a stable shape in most of them, and they're not carrying out this type of process as broadly as eukaryotes do. There are some eukaryotes that have hard cell walls that may not do this, but a lot of them do not. A lot of them are able to do this generally. So this is why people propose this model. We see it all the time in eukaryotes. It's not that far-fetched that something like this happened sometime in the past. That cyanobacterium was brought inside. Initially, when it was brought inside, it was surrounded by the host membrane. That's what wraps around it with this phagocytosis process. And then it had its own cell envelope. Cyanobacteria are gram-negatives. They have um, an inner membrane, a cell wall, and an outer membrane. So it probably looked something like this just after this, symbi this, this interaction occurred. Sometime during the course of this evolution, this became a tighter association between the host and this cyanobacterium. And during the course of that evolution, the cyanobacterium, now the chloroplast, lost some of its surface cell envelope, so maybe it lost one of the outer cell membrane, and as I said before, in the mitochondrial evolution, it seems that all of those alpha proteobacteria lost their peptidoglycan, but in some chloroplast evolution, the peptidoglycan is still there. So it appears that in some lineages, peptidoglycan was kept, and in others, it was thrown away. So you're left with basically the outer membrane, which is the host membrane, and an inner membrane, which is the cyanobacterial membrane. And that's what it looks like if you look in the cell for the simplest of the eukaryotes that have chloroplasts. So if this model is correct, what should phylogenetic trees of genes from the chloroplast genome, chloroplasts still retain DNA from this putative symbiotic event, what should those phylogenetic trees look like? Where should chloroplast group in an evolutionary tree. Yeah. Right, so they should group with cyanobacteria, whatever the closest modern relative is of this symbiont. So somewhere inside this one lineage of the many bacterial lineages, all chloroplasts group. In addition, a very important uh, detail of chloroplast evolution is that 
all of the chloroplasts group together in a monophyletic group to the exclusion of all other organisms that anybody has characterized. All other cyanobacteria, all other things, intracellular organisms, all eukaryotes, whatever, they all form this monophyletic group to the exclusion of all other um, organisms. That is consistent with this theory that people have come up with, which says that the symbiosis, this enveloping a cyanobacterium, happened once in evolutionary history. All chloroplasts are proposed to have been descended from that single symbiotic event. So then the next question people ask is, when did that symbiotic event happen in eukaryotic evolution? So if we look at the eukaryotic tree with these five major lineages of eukaryotes and all the different sub-lineages of eukaryotes, and we splash onto that tree the presence of chloroplasts. I haven't labeled everything on this tree. This is sort of an example. We see that there are chloroplasts found in many of the different lineages of eukaryotes. So we can create a model to explain this. Let's hypothesize that this happened really early in eukaryotic evolution at the base of the eukaryotic tree. Maybe the ancestor had, you know, a mitochondrion, and then shortly thereafter it enveloped a cyanobacterium, and then the common ancestor of all eukaryotes had chloroplasts. And then each of the five major lineages inherited a chloroplast from their ancestors. If that's the case, we are going to have to propose a huge number of loss events in the evolutionary history of eukaryotes to explain all of the lineages that don't have chloroplasts. It's entirely possible throwing away an organelle could easily happen in many lineages. You can actually get some eukaryotes to throw away their mitochondrion. They're not very happy, so if you grow yeast in the lab, for example, every once in a while you'll get a yeast colony that um, and when you're growing them on plates, that's tiny. They're called petites, I think. And those are frequently due to the loss of the mitochondrion. So they can survive. They're generally not happy without their mitochondrion. Maybe the ancestor had chloroplasts, and all eukaryotic lineages that don't have them have thrown it away. If that was the case, we can build a model to test that. We can say that if that was the case, then the lineages that have chloroplasts their chloroplast genes should perfectly match the phylogeny of their nuclear genes and their mitochondrial genes. These all should have been co-evolving since the base of the eukaryotic tree after this symbiotic event. That is not the case. Chloroplast phylogenetic trees are frequently different than nuclear phylogenetic trees. This is, you know, if you look within within this grouping of all the chloroplasts, that topology in the tree does not match the topology perfectly of the organisms from which they came, their nuclei. So that's inconsistent with the model of this ancient symbiosis and chloroplast evolution. So people have come up with an alternative hypothesis. The alternative that they have come up with is based upon a variety of pieces of information, which is that the original symbiosis, did this kick out or I, I can't hear very well up here. So it's okay in the back? Yeah. Okay. So the hypothesis is that in the common ancestor, in the lineage leading up to the common ancestor of the plantae group, that is one of the five major groups of eukaryotes that we talked about, that's where the symbiosis happened. One of the reasons that this has been proposed is that if you look at the evolution of these organisms, the phylogenetic tree of their chloroplasts basically perfectly matches the phylogenetic tree of their nuclear genomes. And in it, all right, maybe not. May, may be very discordant from it, but the theory was based upon this original observation that it matched pretty well to the phylogeny of their um, nuclear genes. Certainly better than the phylogeny matches for some of these other organisms. In addition, when you look inside the cells of these organisms, their structure inside the cell resembles somewhat this structure that I've drawn here. That is a nucleus and a chloroplast with maybe a few membranes around it and a mitochondrion. 
So the hypothesis is that there was what is called a primary symbiosis. That is when one organism brings another organism inside of it, and the organism that it brings inside itself does not have any symbionts. So the hypothesis is that the primary symbiosis in the evolution of chloroplasts occurred on this branch leading up to the common ancestor of the plantae organisms. And the sort of startling hypothesis that comes from this, which took a long time to settle in among the community, is that these lineages that are not in the plantae group acquired chloroplasts by bringing a eukaryotic cell that had chloroplasts inside of them. That is, a eukaryote that did not have a chloroplast brought inside of it one of these organisms from the plantae lineage. And part of the reason for that hypothesis is if you look at these other organisms, the structure of the cell is much more complicated than the structure I just showed you with all sorts of extra membranes and compartments frequently around uh, some of these organelles. And as you will see, some of them even retain even more of the features than you might have expected of this uh, symbiosis. So again, the basic idea is that there was this primary symbiotic event leading to all the lineages here, and that these other lineages brought inside of them a organism from this group. So if we look at the cell model of this, what this basically looks like, I already sort of showed you this, is you have what you could call a normal, boring eukaryote that doesn't have a chloroplast. It has a mitochondrion and a nucleus. It developed a partnership with some photosynthetic eukaryote. Just like the original one developed a partnership with some photosynthetic cyanobacterium underwent the same general process, brought it inside, and now you have a eukaryotic cell inside another eukaryotic cell. Again, you can draw up the membrane such that it looks like something with the mem outer membrane there from the second this host, the inner membrane from the other eukaryote. Sometimes you can't tell eukaryotic membranes from different lineages apart, so it's hard to know which one is which in some cases, but Generally, you would expect it, things to look like this. You actually see things that look like this in some of those other lineages that um, are not in the plantae group. I'll show you some diagrams of this in a minute. And just like with the mitochondrion and chloroplast, some of these different components of this symbiont have been lost. So some of them have thrown away the mitochondrion from this symbiont. Some of them have thrown away the nucleus from the symbiont. Some have thrown away some of these other membranes. And what we observe is we've been looking for chloroplasts, so all of them have to have a chloroplast because that's what we're looking for in this case. So here's a diagram of one of them. This is a cryptomonad. And if you look at this diagram of these cells here, you can see here is what's called the nucleomorph. That's the nucleus of the symbiont that was brought inside. Here's the regular nucleus, the host's nucleus. Here's some membrane around a chloroplast. And the, nuclea, the um, nucleomorph is usually inside a membrane-bound compartment with the chloroplast, as you would expect if this model is correct. Completely wild things out there when you actually look in microscopy at some of these photosynthetic eukaryotes. So if this model were correct, what would we expect the phylogeny of the different genomes to look like? The nuclear genome here should represent the lineage that swallowed the symbiont, that brought it inside, as should this mitochondrial genome. These genomes, however, should represent this new eukaryotic symbiont. So the nucleomorph, the second nuclear genome, should look like one of those lineages in the plantae group. So should the mitochondrion, and so should the chloroplast. So now we can look at this in um, detail. So again, here's the eukaryotic tree. Whichever organism was the 
the host here. Somewhere throughout this eukaryotic tree, one of those organisms brought inside of it one of these plantae organisms. So we should be able to study the evolution of its nucleus to figure out what that host was. And do the same to figure out, to figure out what the symbiont is. Usually all that's left is the chloroplast genome. So we look at the evolution of the chloroplast to figure out what the symbiont was. And we zoom in on the plantae lineage and try and figure out where that chloroplast groups in these different parts of the plantae tree. So let's do an example of this. Here's a euglena, one of the photosynthetic eukaryotes that is not in the plantae group. They're completely wild and cool. Um, here it is down here. It's in the euglenid uh, lineage. If we build an evolutionary tree of its nuclear genes, that's where it gets placed. That's what tells us where this host uh, is. If we look then at the chloroplast genes, the chloroplast genes of euglena group inside the chlorophyte part of the chloroplast tree. So that basically means that this lonely pre-euglenid sort of lonely excavate, that's the lineage that it's in, brought inside of it a chlorophyte. And that chlorophyte became the symbiont inside this euglenid lineage. <coughs> and again, we're decoupling the phylogeny of these different compartments to figure out what model is the correct explanation for the evolutionary history here. So the general hypothesis would be that there was some type of secondary symbiosis that brought some cell that already had symbionts, that's why it's called a secondary symbiosis. It brought that cell into another cell. So when you have a cell that already has its own symbionts being brought inside, that's called a secondary endosymbiosis. And that's how we explain the current structure of all of the DNA, in essence, in the euglena and its relatives. So let's do this again. Diatoms, also photosynthetic, many if not, I think, all of them that are known. There are some amazing structures within the diatom group. This is, I think, a multicellular structure. I think this is a colony of diatoms. Tend to hang out around some sort of uh, um, centroid article there. So diatoms, if we build a phylogenetic tree of their nuclear genes, tell us that they group in this part of the eukaryotic tree, in a lineage, the stromenopiles, within the chrome alveolate group. If we look at it, the chloroplast genes in diatoms, they group inside the red algal lineage with the plantae. So now we can create a model, a lonely stromenopile was wandering around. Little spelling area there, it's stromenopile, not that you guys would notice or care. Um, and then it in, brought inside of it a red, something in the red algal lineage of the plantae group. Became its symbiont. So now we can look at the evolution of the different compartments here, and that's how we can decouple and test this model of what the evolutionary history of diatoms is. <coughs> Looks like there was a secondary symbiosis where red algae was brought inside of another eukaryotic lineage. People have done this with all sorts of different photosynthetic eukaryotes and come up with models that suggest probably 10 at least secondary symbiotic events in the history of various microbial eukaryotes. So you, you understand how you're decoupling, you build this model, that's sort of how you, you have to have this model in order to figure out any of this data really. And then you say, okay, with this symbiotic model, I can look at the evolutionary history of the different components and figure out how this symbiosis happened. Okay, so as I suggested before, and we're going to walk you through it here, amazingly there appear to be even more complicated things out there than secondary symbioses. So there was some other boring, poor, photosynthetic, not containing um, eukaryote that just had its own mitochondrion and was desperate for light energy or something to that effect. 
it found a partner in one of these organisms that had the secondary symbiosis. The key factor here is pretty much photosynthesis. The host doesn't care whether or not it's a secondary symbiosis containing photosynthetic organism or a cyanobacterium. It brings this thing inside of it. It now acquires photosynthesis. And it's this tertiary symbiosis where in the history of this symbiosis, there were seven different genomes. Many of them get thrown away in various parts of this evolutionary history. But the original symbiont had a nucleus, chloroplast, and mitochondrion. Its host had a nucleus and mitochondrion. And this host has a nucleus and mitochondrion. And you have to deconvolute all of this in order to sort through the evolutionary history of these different components. Here's a diagram of one of the cells of what people have proposed is involved in one of these tertiary symbioses. It's a dinoflagellate called cryptoperidinium. And if you look, for example, in this compartment here, there's a membrane around um, these are mitochondrion. This is this nucleomorph or the symbiont's nucleus, and these are the chloroplasts. And the chloroplasts are surrounded by like four or five membranes because they've undergone possibly, tertiary may be an understatement. Some of these may have undergone an enormous number of symbiotic events. And frequently they just retain this history there. It may not be that useful for the organism to be surrounded by this membrane structure after membrane structure after membrane structure. But evolution isn't perfectly optimized. This happened, those membranes were there. Eventually some of them disappear, but in some lineages they don't. So the proposal for this lineage is that it represents a tertiary symbiosis, at least. If we draw that on the tree, there appear to be somewhat controversial, it's still a big argument about these tertiary symbioses. There appear to be at least two or three of them that have occurred in evolutionary history. It's, um, we're just beginning to characterize, actually, the diversity of microbial eukaryotes. So I think a lot of this is coming. We don't really know. We don't have a lot of genome data, for example, for these organisms, and it, it's very useful to have a lot of data for these organisms to try and deconvolute all of those events. What I didn't tell you is that there is a huge extra complication in all of this, which is a process called lateral gene transfer. So I'm going to talk about the general concept of lateral gene transfer in a minute, but during the evolutionary history of all of these symbioses, one thing that is well documented to occur is that after the symbiosis, so after the early eukaryote brought inside of it a mitochondrion, many of the genes that are in the symbiont usually, so the mitochondrion in that case, migrate over evolutionary time to the nucleus of their host. And it's not uniform. So in some lineages, some genes have moved. In other lineages, others have. So today, our mitochondrion in humans only has about, I think, 17 genes or something to that effect. A normal bacterium has about, of the relatives of the mitochondrion, has at least 1,000, if not thousands. Many of those genes were probably thrown away. Many more got moved to the nucleus. After the chloroplast evolutionary event in the plant A lineage, many of the genes in the chloroplast were also moved to the nucleus. After the secondary symbiotic events, some of the genes that are in that chloroplast move to the new nucleus. Some of the genes in the nucleomorph, the symbiont's <coughs> nucleus, move to the new host's nucleus. Deconvoluting all of this is very complex. And that's even when we know sort of who the partners are. And that's by this general process, which you could call lateral gene transfer. DNA mixing between different branches, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Are there any questions about this endosymbiosis before I switch over to talking about uh, lateral gene transfer? Yeah. I just want to make sure I understand this. So with the genes lambda, for So, so what they do is, in essence, yes, but it's, they, they do the whole picture. So they look at the nucleus of the euglena, 
and they ask, where does that put Euglenus? What is the, the core of Euglena? And that puts it in this lineage that's very distantly related from the plant egg group. Okay. So that's in this, the Euglenid lineage. Um, and then they say, well, if it brought inside of it something from the plant egg group, where the chloroplast groups relative to other members of the plant egg group in trees should tell us what it brought inside. So when they build trees of the chloroplast DNA, from the euglena, its genes in that chloroplast group inside the part of the tree where chlorophytes are. So the model then, that's how you figure out what it brought inside, because for euglenas, the nucleus of the symbiont is gone. The mitochondrion of the symbiont is gone. All that's left of that symbiont, if this model is correct, is the chloroplast. And, all, and the host still has its own nucleus and its own mitochondrion. So you can use that to figure out what the host was, and the chloroplast tells you what the symbiont was. In some of these other lineages, the, the nucleus of the symbiont is still there as well. So you could use either the chloroplast or the nucleus of the symbiont to tell you what was brought inside. And hopefully they agree with each other. If they don't, then you have to come up with a different model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, on the tree, uh, secondary symbiosis Sorry, secondary symbiosis would yeah, be... Yeah, like where would you mark it on the tree? I mean, the way I drew it was just... I have this tree, the backbone of the tree is sort of the nucleus of all the cells. And then in red, I drew the secondary symbioses that have been proposed. So I have a cell, always from something in this plant A group, going into some other eukaryotic lineage. And then... I just drew in green the, to make it Christmassy or something, I don't know, to draw the tertiary symbioses. Um, I, for the tertiary symbioses, it would be more appropriate to show first the secondary symbiosis, then the other symbiosis, but I, I had no idea how to draw that. So, um, yeah. So, so the, if you look inside the cell of a lot of these organisms, one thing that led to this hypothesis of secondary symbioses is that some chloroplasts are surrounded by too many membranes. More than three, that is, you know, more than just the original cyanobacterial membranes and the host membrane. And there are many models you could use to explain that. But that's what led people to say, that's weird, maybe there was yet another symbiosis. So if you look at chloroplasts, I mean, you can count the number of membranes that are around them, and you can look at the structure of the cell. That helps propose the models. But really, what you want to do is some type of phylogenetic analysis, because you could imagine you could just add a membrane around something. Bam, you're done, right? I mean, so it, it, it's much simpler to sort of manipulate membrane structure than it is to have a phylogenetic tree of some of these genes point to the totally wrong place. That does happen occasionally, mind you, but um, we tend to trust the sort of phylogenetic analysis over the structure of these cells. Although, the, some great cell biologists looking at lots of different single-celled eukaryotes are who figured all of this out without any of these trees. So it's a both. You use that both types of information to sort of sort out what's going on. And still today, that's what people do. So um, what I want to talk about in the last uh, 15 minutes here is shifting topics a little bit, although, as you'll see, it's very related because there's movement of DNA between organisms, similar to movement of organisms into other organisms. Um, and to sort of set this up, I want to talk about first um, the sort of general mode of trait transmission during the growth of bacteria and archaea, um, which is called binary fission. Before I get to that, sorry, I forgot about this. So um, many of you have probably heard of or looked at or you know, seen things related to lateral gene transfer in the press all the time because when you put selective pressure on organisms like antibiotics in an environment like your body where there are lots of uh, organisms that would get killed by those antibiotics, 
One of the ways that organisms can evolve a new trait is to steal traits from other taxa. So you can invent a trait yourself, or you can sort of acquire it from another organism, either your relatives, so that's sort of sexual reproduction, or unfortunately you can acquire it from more distantly related organisms, like what happens with um, things like antibiotic resistance in people. Bacteria are able to sort of spread their DNA around. So this is why a lot of people study lateral gene transfer extensively. It is a very powerful force in changing sort of phenotype in a lot of organisms by DNA moving around. So what I want to now back up and talk about just trait transmission in organisms. So in the big picture, if you look at bacteria and archaea, their sort of general default mode of trait transmission it seems incredibly simple, and it is somewhat simple. It's a process called binary fission that we will go through. And that sort of default mode of transition seems a lot sort of, again, less complex than what goes on in most eukaryotic lineages, which have mitosis for the duplicating cells and then uh, sexual reproduction to lead to mixing of genes from different lineages. And they have this alternation of mitotic and meiotic processes, as you will see a lot more about later. Um, sexual reproduction, as we see in eukaryotes, does not really happen in bacteria and archaea. But you will see this lateral gene transfer does many similar things to sexual reproduction. So in binary fission, is pretty simple, and it occurs in lots of bacteria and archaea. Basically, you take the DNA in the cell, you make a copy of it. And then the cell splits down in the middle, and each of the two daughter cells this is where binary comes from, gets a copy of the genome. You're done, and this goes on. Here's a little video of it. I speed it up. This probably, in some organisms, this division happens every 20 minutes. It's what we call doubling time in uh, bacteria and archaea and other organisms. Some of them, it happens every, there's some that we've measured it, and it might be every year. So some are pretty slow. Some are much faster. If we draw this out, we can draw a tree of binary fission events that's going to look remarkably like an evolutionary tree here. So we have a parent cell, splits in two, the daughter cells get copies of the genome, each gets copies, each gets copies, and we start to multiply. This is very analogous in concept to an evolutionary tree with parental species and daughter species. Again, like I said, the phylogenetic trees that we draw of species throw away all this other complicated stuff that goes on inside organisms. This is sort of the simple stuff that goes on when you're just dividing in a test tube or in an environment. That's not, of course, um, all there is. So much of the time when the cell copies its genome and makes mistakes, some organisms it's more frequent than others. Um, and mutations happen. So mutation is a heritable change in the genome of an organism. So you start out with binary fission, maybe all things work the first time, and then occasionally you get a mutation in one lineage. The daughter cell is different than the parent cell. You get mutations in other lineages, and you generate diversity that way. Looks a lot like an evolutionary tree with character state changes mapped onto it because I took the same figure. Um, but in general, it works by the same, same concept. You have parents producing offspring, and occasionally in one lineage you have a change, and then the descendants inherit that change. This binary fission is also frequently referred to as asexual reproduction, just making a copy, not mixing and matching things. It's also known as clonal reproduction, cloning being copying. Asexual reproduction happens in eukaryotes. That's what ha happens in our bodies, generating all the somatic cells in our bodies. There are many uh, free-living microbial eukaryotes that much of the time they reproduce by just copying themselves and then occasionally will undergo sexual reproduction. Sometimes this is also called vertical transmission. I drew it like a vertical tree. That's why it's also called vertical transmission, parent to offspring. So now I'm going to compare and contrast one extra layer of complication on here. So we had mutation. 
Now we're going to have mixing of DNA in different lineages. So we have the parent cell producing offspring, some mutations. I needed space for the rest of the diagram, so I had this mutation kill things. Um, some mutations, you know, survive. And in bacteria and archaea, there's a process, a general process called lateral gene transfer, where DNA moves from one lineage to another lineage. We'll see the mechanisms for this in a minute. So DNA moves from one lineage to another. We're just going to generally call that lateral gene transfer. The recipient then gets, is a mixture. The recipient gets its DNA from its parent, as well as some DNA from another organism. It's a hybrid or a chimera. And then it now transmits its traits to its offspring by binary fission. This, many people call this lateral gene transfer. It's also called horizontal gene transfer to contrast with this vertical inheritance. This is now horizontal inheritance from one lineage to another. <coughs> A very similar thing in some levels occurs within eukaryotes by sexual reproduction. So we have mutations accumulating by the sort of default asexual reproduction that happens in different eukaryotic lineages. And then two organisms will produce gametes via meiosis. You will have fertilization and get a new offspring, and that offspring can then reproduce. This is now mixing DNA from different lineages. So both lateral gene transfer and sexual reproduction can be considered forms of recombination. Recombination is mixing, in essence, DNA from different lineages. You have mutation generating variation, and then this mixing, this recombination, creating an enormous amount of diversity of all of those different possible combinations. In eukaryotes, the normal sort of default process for this is sexual recombination, sexual reproduction. And we've seen, you know, sort of that's what creates the population patterns in eukaryotic organisms. So I'm going to skip over the mechanisms for a second and just compare and contrast sexual reproduction and lateral gene transfer. So like with everything, first of all, in um, biology, there are some gray areas here. So sec lateral gene transfer of this like I drew here, also happens in some eukaryotes, maybe many. So it's not unique to bacteria and archaea, although it seems to be much more common in many bacteria and archaea. So the similarity is they're both forms of recombination. They both lead to mixing of DNA from different lineages and can create new genetic combinations. But they're different in that lateral gene transfer is unidirectional. DNA goes from one organism to another. Sexual reproduction is a mixing of the genomes of two lineages. Sexual reproduction basically always involves the entire genome. I mean, the organisms split their chromosomes to make it a cell haploid, but it's the total genomic content in essence. Lateral gene transfer usually involves small fractions of the genome. A gene, 10 genes, a small amount of the genome. The nasty thing for evolutionary biologists, although one of the coolest things, is that lateral gene transfer can occur across incredibly large evolutionary distances. Sexual reproduction is basically within species or among close relatives where you have hybridization events. Lateral gene transfer can go from bacteria into eukaryotes, from archaea into bacteria, across all of the different phyla. DNA can move across the whole tree of life. So that's very different in the effect on evolution from sexual reproduction. And then I'm going to, just going to go back if you're, you have the printouts of the slides. So another feature that sort of sets apart lateral gene transfer, although this isn't per se a feature, is that if you compare all eukaryotes, 
the basic underpinnings of sexual reproduction, the molecular details of chromosome sorting and mixing, etc., are pretty similar across all eukaryotes. How they carry out sex, of course, is very diverse, but the exact details of the molecular details are pretty uniform. Lateral gene transfer occurs by an incredible diversity of distinct mechanisms. I'm going to show you three of those mechanisms here. I think these are the same three that are covered in the book. Um, so one is called transformation. It's a very simple in concept. You have an organism, DNA somehow leaks out of its cell into the environment. The cell could die, the cell could purposefully secrete DNA, lots of different ways it can get out. You have another organism that brings the DNA inside. In some cases, the organism may just be eating. DNA has energy in it. In other cases, it may be a tightly regulated process of soaking up foreign DNA. But in the end, the DNA can get incorporated into the genome of that organism and then get transmitted to its offspring. So you have DNA coming from possibly all sorts of distances from different types of organisms into one by this transformation process. A second, which I have this little video going up here. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I'll, maybe I'll post it. Is um, a process called transduction, where you have viruses that infect a cell. The way many viruses work is they attach to the outside of a cell. They poke a hole in it, and they inject their DNA or RNA into their host. That then takes over the machinery of the host. It makes lots of copies of the virus and packages up new viruses and usually kills that host. During that packaging process, some of the genome of the host can end up inside the viral package. And the viruses can then take their genome to a new, the, the DNA from the host to another host. When they do that, that's called transduction. We take advantage of this in molecular biology labs all the time because it's how we move DNA from one organism to another by taking advantage of this mistake in packaging that viruses do. And then the last um, process I want to mention for lateral gene transfer is called conjugation. Conjugation in bacteria and archaea basically works by cells coming into contact with each other. A, what's called a bridge forms between the cells, sometimes called this conjugation tube, and DNA is physically passed from one cell to the other through this bridge. You actually see DNA being physically passed from one cell to another in microbial eukaryotes too. It is also frequently called conjugation. It is an evolutionarily distinct process. But in bacteria and archaea, this conjugation is frequently used to pass small circles of DNA called plasmids. That's what's shown in this figure. And that is responsible for some of the transfer of antibiotic resistance, for example, uh, between organisms. So again, we have very distinct processes here, here, but the effect is the same. The unidirectional transfer of DNA from one organism, one lineage, to another, in contrast to sexual reproduction. So uh, we'll stop there.